a lot of time that's wasted because of the way they process patients in a linear way. We created, you can say, the Air New Zealand check-in experience for the DHBs. So by the time they are checked in, all that paperwork is already done. Welcome back to another episode of a Kiwi Original. This is episode 14. And today on the show, I have Michael Greenstein from Florence Health, a company that is what you would call in New Zealand a tech company. But it's more than that. It is a company that is revolutionizing the clinical experience. So patients have a better time uh, and doctors can do business in a different way to help people in a more effective manner. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming on the show, Michael. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what Florence Health does. Like, what's the what's the problem that your software or your technology um, sets out to solve? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, just to put it simply, over the next years, the demand for resources on the healthcare system are growing. Uh, we have the age wave, so we have a lot of people in older years and they're going to need health care. But the resources available are going to remain somewhat constant. So as things, as more patients need more services, we're not going to see that many more hospitals. We're not going to see that many more clinics. We won't see bigger waiting rooms. So BHBs right now have to figure out how to do more with what they have. And in the process of, of handling patients, there's a lot of inefficiencies. And what Florence tries to solve is figure out ways of lessening these inefficiencies and making things work better, smoother, faster, quicker, for the benefit of the clinicians, but also the patients. So decreased waiting times for clinic services and increased capabilities in the clinic room themselves because there's a lot of waste in the back room, a lot of time that's wasted because of the way they process patients in a linear way. And Florence comes in and and makes this a little bit smoother and gives back people their time. So this is a a solution for district health boards or places where there is that um, patient-to-doctor relationship Uh, and probably something that the businesses have been through you know, for many years, if, if not always, is how can we do more with less and how can we be more productive? Um, what's different in terms of, uh, in this particular cycle, if you like, of what Florence Health is, the health is delivering? Like, how are you able to do um, or help these DHBs do more with less that has never been done before? Okay. Um, well, we started off with a uh, project with the Auckland District Health Board, And they were interested in creating a self-check-in for a particular clinic in the ophthalmology clinic at Green Lane. So we were commissioned um, to develop this this product, this procedure. And through that is what was the birth of of Florence, per se. And so we created, you can say, the Air New Zealand check-in experience for the DHBs. So you know how comfortable it is now. You used to go to the check-in counter and you deal with the person there and get your tickets and your baggage. But now you don't even think about doing that unless you have to. You go over to the kiosk and you, you know, you either do it on your phone or you know you have and, and you check in. And so that same kind of situation we can use for patients who come into the hospital. So the first step of the way is we have a self-checking kiosk, and the patient walks up to one of these units, and if they have their NHI number or if they have their letter that has their NHI number on it, or in some cases the letters that you get sent for your appointments have a barcode on them. So you walk up to the kiosk and you either scan your letter or type in your NHI number. It knows it's Ryan, and then it proceeds to ask you some questions, and then it checks you in to your, to your, to your appointment. And it tells you what lobby area to go wait in, what waiting room. So that's the first part of the function. Now that's not there to replace the receptionist. It's there to take care of some pretty routine things that a receptionist needs to do that can be handled through automation easier, which leaves more time for the receptionist to actually interface with the patient. And so when you check in, they have to ask questions. You have to make sure your demographics are up to date and your phone number is right and your address is right and your next to kin is right. 
they have to ask you if you want to stop smoking. So there's all this interaction that goes on, takes time to check in. Meanwhile, you have 10 people who are also wanting to check in to their appointments. So all this has to be done for each patient. So the kiosk relieves the receptionist of that. And, and so we can ask about the smoke compensation. We can have demographic updates on the kiosks themselves. So by the time they are, are checked in, all that paperwork is already done. That makes sense now because I, you know, just the way you've made that metaphor uh, or that contrast with the airline industry, uh, certainly the difference in those airlines that have rolled out technology means that the people that are working for the airlines, like Air New Zealand, can focus on the customer service and actually making you feel wel- welcome and comfortable rather than the actual uh, the technical checking in procedures. Is Is that the... The same approach here that you let the, does the technology then um, almost call forward to the the hospital to say, you can expect this patient, they've they've checked in on their app? Like how, what are the benefits for the hospital or for the clinician? Okay, you're you're actually getting ahead now, but that's exactly where we're going with this. This is the first step in, in, in bettering this patient journey. And so now we have a self check-in, but like you say, what about how long is my wait going to be? I just checked in for my 9.30 appointment, but really you're not going to be seen till 10.30. They know that because there's a backlog of people. So our next project that we're currently engaged in, and we do have a pilot running in a facility in Auckland DHB, is what we call, a, we have a patient tracking system. And this system actually acquires a timestamps of a patient's journey so we're able to produce data that gives that time stamp information back to the patients and to the clinicians. Wow. And so a typical a typical patient activity in an appointment might be, you know, in some cases they're very simple. You go into a room, you talk to your doctor, and you leave. But a lot of times you got to get a shot, or you got to get your the picture taken of your eye, or you got to go to radiology. You got to do other things mm-hmm. during this appointment. Each one of those takes up time. And so what we're doing is calculating what are the times of each of those activities and then and then using that data and we're be able to feed it back to the patients in forms of a L C D L E D display where we'll have it in the lobby or in the cafeteria so people can see how long where they are in the queue. We're gonna use mobile devices where they can be queued on their mobile device and they could be summons to their appointment at that point so they don't have to sit in the lobby area they can sit in the coffee shop and be called to their appointment and so we are now in the process of developing this product and uh fortunately we've got some nice partners with us too because we're you know we're 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 working with some groups of people to make this all happen and it's very exciting because this particular piece is is this is the equation that makes a huge difference it does because I mean I know from personal experience it's the it's not necessarily the waiting that's the problem it's the unknown time like if you know that it's only two minutes to wait you're going to stick in that lobby and you're not going to move but if you knew it was going to be an hour and a half maybe you'd sit outside in the sun or maybe you would go and read a book you would be able to use that time or at least you know for some people it's more around psychologically being prepared for something that maybe they don't want to even do. They don't want to be there. So um, I, I think being able to use that data in a way which is uh, providing it back to the patient makes it actually a better experience. And I, I wonder what that would then do for the the clinician engagement when you've got someone that's maybe at a lower stress level going into the appointment. Yeah, that's huge you didn't even know about that because that whole waiting, that's its own discipline. And you're exactly right. Your perceived wait time versus your real wait time can be totally two different things. If you and the stress comes when when there's a difference between those two. So if if you were told that you have a 10:30 appointment and the appointment is at 11 and you were told that, then that half hour goes pretty easy. But if you're there at 10:30 and no one's seeing you or anything and it's 11, you're going, what's going on here? I had a 10:30 appointment. So just you know being able to mitigate that does lessen that stress even to the point where somebody has a 10:30 appointment and they're in they're in the parking lot trying to get a parking space which as we all know most hospitals have some pretty rough parking 
And so here you are, you know you're going to be late. You're just stressing, trying to get to your appointment on time because you know if you're 15 minutes late, you know, there's a good chance they're not going to see you anymore. And so wouldn't it be great to have some way to, to communicate, to let that clinic know that you're here, you're just trying to get there. You're, you're, in, the, you're in, the, in the parking lot. So these are the small nuances that we'll be able to do to, to lessen that stress on that, on that patient. Exactly. What do you need from the DHB? So if someone from a district health board is listening to this, what's the um, what's the engagement process like with Florence Health to to go through the steps from um, you know doing the feasibility or scoping through to like a full rollout? What's that whole process like? That, and that is what we do: is we start off with an engagement where we do scope out and find out where the problems are because um, we do have these products. Separated, so we have the self check-in as a standalone product to that next part where we where we uh, where we find out the times. You know, we, we're taking getting that data as our patient tracking system. So they're two different animals; they work together. Um, so we do do the scoping. One of the key things is our ability to interact with the patient administration, the patient information system for that hospital. So there's 20 DHBs. And there's four or five different one of these PAS systems throughout New Zealand. So the South Island's got one. We got several. They got two or three decks in the South Island. And we got, and then even the same application of a PAS, different DHBs have tweaked it. So they're still a little different. So our first goal is to be able to talk to that PAS because we have to be able to check that patient in and, and know what their demographics are. So we're not moving around any medical information. It's just that the demographic information and we have to know their, their appointment schedule. And so that's key. And so we are now working with the manufacturers of these pads. And so we have integrated to three of them right now. And so that's the first key because that's a fairly expensive operation to get that whole thing going. And so once we have that down, then it's a matter of engaging with the DHBs and finding out, you know, where their problems are. Um, usually the busier clinics are the ones that need our services off, off the bat. So the ones that are serving 300 patients or more a day are usually the ones that are best served with this kind of automation. But it really, when you get down to it, will work down. Once you have the system in, it'll work down to, you know, a, a smaller clinic also. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. So that, that seems like a lot of upfront work in terms of coding and, and software development into the, what would they call the PAS, P-A-S, is that right? PAS, yes, yes. Patient Administration. Patient Administration System. So there's obviously a lot of investment that's gone in upfront with the expectation that DHBs in New Zealand will take this on as a way of becoming more efficient and offering a, a, a better patient service. Is there, um, you know, looking forward for Florence Health, is there an export opportunity? Are there other health markets that this could potentially uh, solve the same foundation problems just with different software integrations? Absolutely. So, yes, all these paths that are here in New Zealand also are distributed globally so there so yes so once we're integrated with them here and 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 like many tech companies you know new zealand is where things get developed and tested and marketed and once things are sweet here then it's smart to go ahead and take that abroad and with our systems we have to be we have to have total remote control over this thing so if it's sitting in thailand we got to you know, make sure that we can totally take care of it remotely so you know these are kind of the growing things that you have to they have to get into and uh yeah but the the, the big focus here is definitely on the global market once we get this all sorted here in new zealand super exciting now um michael you know we know each other from you know previous lives working together when uh, i did some time in hawks bay um mm -hmm. what's it like uh, for those who are listening uh running a um a software organization from Hawke's Bay versus where, uh, you know, Kiwis are more, um, probably more aware of something being run out of Wellington or Auckland. What's the differences that um, you find with you and your team working from Hawke's Bay? More airplane rides. 
<laughs> you know, because <laughs> um, really, it, you know, it, it's you know, having lived in Auckland for a while and, and moved around the country there and being here, you have that extra hop you got to make to Auckland quite a bit. Um, you know, now with the situation we're doing our uh, home isolation, um, we're doing a lot of the, you know, the uh, the conference calling and video. So I used to use that a lot anyway. I do physically need to go to hospitals and it's good to be in front of people. Um, but I think this is the new normal. <laughs> We're going to see a lot more of the video conferencing as possible. So now being in the provinces will be, you know, the same as being anywhere else. But prior to this, yes, I did have to travel a little bit more by making the Auckland hop, but, but you still can get anywhere. And, and, and living in the provinces, I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, Auckland's an hour away. I need to be there. Wellington's an hour away. So, excellent. And do um, when you go and visit your your customers in the the medical profession, um, what type of insight does that give you in terms of being able to then develop the product further? Oh, it's, that's so key, Ryan. It's like everything we do is is driven by the needs of the clinicians and the patients. So, you know, we have to find their problems. Fortunately, I've got people involved in Florence that have medical experience, so they know the insides of how things work in the healthcare industry, and that has that helped out quite a bit. But each product, we, we, we actually develop it with a partner, a healthcare partner, uh, and that way, we, you know, we are learning in, in organically what the problems are and organically how to solve them. Case in point, this patient tracking system that we have on a pilot in, in uh, Green Lane, the, ortho, uh, the ophthalmology, there's a situation there where the system works really well, but the clinicians aren't doing what they need to do to make the system work right because there's no value to the clinicians for hitting a button. It doesn't do anything to them. It doesn't speed up their process. It doesn't, it's just one more thing in a very busy schedule that they have to deal with. So, you know, so when we developed this, we realized right off the bat that that was going to be kind of a, a situation. Even though they love it now, they use it, they know what it does. You know, we had to create ways that the system would work without them having to interface with it as much. So we took the onus off the clinicians and, and, and now allow the system to do what it needs to do using barcodes and we've got some other new technologies that we're, we're bringing in to, to make the process transparent to the users, which is really nice. So they end up with data. It's really, uh, it's good to hear that you're approaching it from that perspective because uh, technology doesn't solve the business process. It just optimizes it or allows it to do things in a, in a different way. Um, so if Florence Health, if you've got those people with experience from the clinician industry from the health industry, then it gives you kind of a unique advantage in a way. Um, maybe if you were to um, maybe cover some of the things that are unique within health that maybe um, other industries and in, in business don't have to be, um, uh, they're less stringent, for example, uh, with data protection or privacy and regulations. What are some of the additional things that you've got to be um, aware of within health that don't affect other industries as much. Mm, no, that's you know the privacy thing is huge, uh, and since we don't really move around any healthcare data, we're able to to uh, you know work around that. Um, and and you know being able to our system lives in the cloud, and that's a precarious place in the healthcare market right now. Um, they're finally starting to use the cloud and not have to have you know internal servers anymore so we're we're getting there but that you know that's something that other businesses have adopted cloud computing much quicker than the healthcare industry um you're right it's it's something i um i, I remember when i was in, in telecommunications that the the industries that had the longest gestation was health government council and defense and they were highly lucrative, but you needed to have patients, like not patients as in the, you know, the, the hospital hey. patients, but you just needed to be able to hold your breath for a long, long time. So, um, you know, well done for being in this arena because 
the you know hospitals were one of the first things that were established in you know in society they were they were a pillar uh, along with education and government they're their foundational uh, industries and they work in a standardized way because that's the way they've always worked even though you know cloud technology has been around almost 20 years now so are you finding that or or has the penny dropped and now there's a a awareness that you know, we're not going to do it with more buildings or, or more humans. Yeah, I, I believe, especially with the COVID-19 issues, things, this is a whole new game, a whole new playing field. You know, this whole, the whole thing with the telemed, you know, the telemedicine, being able to consult with a patient has been around for years. I've got some doctors next door. They never used it. Now it's all they can use and they love it. I think there's a lot of adoption and the patients like it too. And, you know, they can see a lot more patients, you know, now than they could before because they're adopting some of these things that they, that they were, you know, arms length away before too. So, so yeah, I think we're going to see a change, but to answer part of the other question is what's different with, with working in, in this vertical, you know, in New Zealand, we have 20 DHBs and they all operate independently. And so, you know, I've got to deal with each one individually. And I also, you know, don't really can't share knowledge between each one. So that mm. becomes careful on how you, you know, you go about doing this. Um, so that's been, you know, one of the interesting parts of working, especially here in New Zealand. You know, you have basically 20 different customers that all have the same needs, you know. And I actually wish it would be a, a more unified system because I think it would be less expensive for healthcare New Zealand, for the Ministry of Health, if if they could if they could do this on more of a global scale rather than you know for each chb we have a lot of different costs involved if it could be done over a wider uh area it would be more beneficial to the healthcare system um so so the follow-up question there michael is um i mean you're a software company but you can't necessarily uh, influence what how government's going to structure their their health departments um, given COVID-19 and given that uh, everyone's working to a, a whole new set of rules or maybe no rules at all um, what would be you know your ask of government at this at this time uh, or to consider once we're through this this phase what are some of the things that you know you're seeing from the ground level and knowing what you know around how technology can solve some of these problems, um, what would be your request into government? And, well, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, the separation thing, you know, we've got it now, it might come up again. Having having a kiosk at reception really does a number to separate that first line of communication. And so, and so, I, you know, if we had these systems in place now, all you know, throughout the country, it would be a different situation being able to go up to your clinic and, and actually have that first interaction. Right. So you can actually, the, the problem with the current doctor's rooms is you've got to go in to reception and you're already within your two meter bubble of everyone who's waiting. So would this, would your kiosk then separate that to a two meter area that is defined around where this physical kiosk is rather than where the physical reception is. Absolutely can do that. Exactly. And we can ask those important questions before they go any further, you know, that if they, you know, if they've been anywhere out of the country, you know, whatever we actually, before the, before the clinics got closed down for the, for the lockdown, we, we had that question on the kiosks. We actually asked that COVID question before they even, you know, started. And the kiosk can be cleaned, and you know, so that all can be taken care of. And we actually have another solution now where you can walk up to the kiosk and use your phone to operate the kiosk. So you don't even have to touch the kiosk anymore. So there's, you know, different ways you can interact with a piece of equipment. So, and, and that's super smart too, because uh, like going back to that airline analogy, I'm really comfortable with the Air New Zealand app and how to order coffee or check in. Uh, and I know my, you know, 71 year old mum is really confident using her own phone to mm -hmm. navigate her life. Uh, if there was an app on there to check in the kiosk, she'd find it just as easy because it's her own phone. Right. That's right. If, 
is a this is a kiosk of its own form. Exactly. And because River Group, everything we do is web based, you know, we certainly the if we're device irrelevant. It doesn't matter what device. So kiosk, laptop, iPad, phone, any of that will work our system. Um, what was the, where did this technology all come from? How, who created it? Why was it created? Uh, um, you know, what was the origin story of this? Because this is a fascinating Kiwi story that I don't think a lot of people know about. No, you mean in particular the, the whole Florence, the, how this whole thing yeah. came about? Yeah, and it was, it was that, it was that engagement, you know, Luke and Fingermark were involved in digital signage and kiosks and, and, and the ADHB was interested in coming up with a self-check-in solution. And this was back who four years ago, I think, five years ago, maybe longer. And so that's when this whole thing started gestating. Now here's an interesting thing. So that was being worked on by Florence. Years have gone by. We've had a couple of people who've taken the helm of this and moved it forward a little bit, kick, kick, kick the ball down the road. And now we're, you know, we're, we're ramping up and doing really well. And it turns out that the original, guy who wrote the software for that kiosk is now back with it, working on this and the original person from ADHB who was the business manager business analysis who was responsible for that project she now works with Florence so we've got some people who have been in this game this particular game for you know since day one who are still at it because they enjoy doing it and, and we see the benefits and how will you know, Michael, when you've left your mark? Like, what does success look like when you've done your job at Florence? When when I see these kiosks, we're in four different DHBs now, and I'd like to see them in all 20. Uh, and I, I will stay at this until I see them in all 20. Well, well, that's a wonderful goal, and I have no doubt you will achieve it. I, I know that you're... Uh, very forward in terms of business development and your listening skills of what a client wants um, is probably something that's unique because there's a lot of salespeople that just talk about features and benefits and I think through our relationship over the years it's been your listening skills and being able to get to the the root of the problem before um, proposing any solutions so um, I wish you all success with Florence Health and uh, you know, I look forward to seeing what you're doing in terms of uh, New Zealand made technology. We need more of it. It is a great export for this country. And, uh, you know, if this can be rolled out to other countries, it certainly will bring back some export receipts to New Zealand for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to talking to you again, maybe in a year. Sounds good to me, Michael. Appreciate your time, particularly in this uh, busy period we're going through. So uh, thanks very much for being on the show. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.